Hey there, welcome to day 12. In this one, we're gonna be scraping websites to extract data. Now, you may be familiar with what this is, but undoubtedly you've used the result of it. Now, if you look at something like Google, it actually scrapes data from websites. It, it opens up websites, grabs some interesting data or crawls that website, extracts data that it finds interesting, and then turns it into a search engine. That is something that Google did and has done very well, and nobody's even come close to them. So what we wanna do here is actually learn the basics of web scraping and also use some of the modern tools of actually executing this to make it happen. Now, the challenge here is actually parsing the data. It's not the actual grabbing the data. Grabbing the data is super easy because of Python requests, but even if you weren't using Python requests, it's not that hard to open up a web page. So let's take a look at the website we're gonna be using. In this case, it's gonna be boxofficemojo.com. So if you're not familiar with this website, all it does is it lists off the box office sales for any given movie at that time. And if you click on worldwide, you'll see the 2020 worldwide statistics or whatever year you're watching this. This is probably not gonna change a whole lot in the future, although some things of it might. But the general concept is that we wanna use a Python program to look for these numbers right here. Now, a big part of the reason I want to do this, well, one, it's really useful to know how to do web scraping. Two, IMDB itself doesn't have what's called an API. Now, a lot of services, down at the bottom, you'll see something like developer or API or developer services. A lot of them will have something called an API, which essentially makes it really easy for Python to just grab this sort of data. I definitely intend to cover that as one of the days is actually working with an API, so make sure that you stay around for that. But for now, what I'm gonna do is actually use Python to grab the data that's in here. It will be certainly helpful to understand some basic HTML and CSS to actually make this really effective outside of using Box Office Mojo. But even if you don't fully understand it, you can still get a, a good amount of things out of web scraping uh, anyway. So let's go ahead and start off with the code. I'm gonna jump into VS Code and in my project, I'm gonna make a new directory for day 12. And in here, I'll make a new file and we'll just call this scrape.py. And I wanna import Python requests. Now, I wanna make sure that I actually have that installed in my general Python 3 installation. So Python 3-m pip install requests. It's a really good chance that you already have it installed because we have used it already. Um, so what I wanna do is actually, I wanna see the result of Python requests. So before I actually write a bunch of code, let's go ahead and take a look here. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the actual terminal and we're gonna jump into Python 3, import requests, and we wanna grab our URL. So the URL is going to be, let's just use this URL right here. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and copy that entire thing, paste it in, okay. So one of the things that you can usually ignore when it comes to URLs is anything after a question mark. In some cases, you don't wanna use that, you don't wanna lose those things, but in our case here, I definitely do not need what's ever after that question mark, including the question mark. So I'm just gonna go ahead and throw that in there and see and make sure that it's still rendering out that same page, and of course it is. Okay, so what I wanna do is open up this page using Python, much like you would with a web browser. So you'd say r equals to requests.get the URL and hit enter. And then if we do r.status underscore code, likely you'll see a 200, this is a success code, that's great. And then if we do r.text, what we get is a bunch of HTML. Now, if you're not familiar with what HTML is, it's the backbone of every single web page. So to see HTML for any given web page, just open up your web browser. It works best if you're on a desktop web browser, your mobile web browsers don't work as well as finding the source code, um, but desktop ones definitely do. You're gonna wanna go to view developer and view source. Right now I'm in Chrome. All of them have it, Safari, Firefox, Opera, they all have a way to view this source code. If you need to, you might have to actually activate some developer tools to make that happen. So anyways, this is the HTML. This is what's driving that page. So if I scroll down to the bottom, 
I'll see the exact same stuff as I did with, so right here, there you go. I got all this stuff right here. This should be exactly the same or roughly exactly the same to what we've got down here. Okay, I mean, some things might be gone because of what JavaScript does. JavaScript actually will change HTML pages and this will not work or the method we're about to do will not work on JavaScript heavy pages. We have a method to do that and I will show you that just not today in day 12. Um, so anyways, the idea here is we are able to open up this HTML. Now is the real hard part is parsing out that HTML. So before I do the actual parsing, let's go ahead and save this text into a file that we can actually open up again. So I'll just go ahead and say define URL to file and it'll take in a URL. And again, we'll go ahead and say R equals to requests.get that URL and if status or rather R dot status underscore code equals equals to 200. Then we'll go ahead and say HTML text equals to R dot text. Okay. Um, so we actually need a file name for this probably. So file name equals to, and I'll just go ahead and do world.html, as in it's gonna be the end of this URL, world.html. And I wanna save this somewhere. So I can just go ahead and say with open and file name, and we'll write it as f, and then f.write HTML text. And then I'll even return that HTML text if I wanna change this to something different later. Because in general, I mean, you might want to actually save the resulting HTML. You don't have to, but I just want to put into practice the things that we've already learned. So I'm going to go ahead and just call this in here. Um, I'm calling it right in line just to make it easy for me. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and exit this out because we will change that over time. So I'm in my project, of course, and I'm going to go ahead and CD into day 12 and then Python 3-i and scrape.py. And so um, I get a response does not have status. Oops, I spelled status incorrectly. Status code. Maybe you caught that. Don't you love spell spelling errors? Okay, so I ran it and let's go ahead and take a look at day 12 in the finder. And what do you know? There's world.html. Now, if you open this up into your web browser, notice that I have this page is now on my local system, right? So everything about the data that we need has already been saved. So this is an interesting way to eventually store data. Like if you don't know how to actually parse the data yet, this would be a really clever way to keep that data and have it relevant to what it is that you're working on. Uh, so another way to think about this too is to just grab our date and time. So if I did import date time, and then I said something like now equals to date time dot date time dot now, and then year equals to now dot year, or rather now just, just now dot year. What I can do is actually change this file name to being a little bit different. And I'll just go ahead and say world dash year and use that string substitution and then do dot html again exit out of this and scrape it through and what we'll see is i now have a year or a, some sort of date object in there uh, you could do a lot more you could do you could do day month you can do all that stuff and pass that into the actual file and save that locally and then once you do that you can start doing this on all sorts of web pages and then come back and try and figure out how to actually parse through this data because we now have it stored and saved. Of course, we don't need to do that right now, but it is a interesting way to go about doing things. But what we wanna do is actually find the data that we really need. And in my case, I've got this 2020 world box office data. It's already nice and structured for me, but I just need to extract it and turn this into like a CSV file, a comma separated values file. So how do we go about finding any individual element in here? Like how do I get this entire you know, table instead of anything else? 
So to do this, we're gonna use another package and that's pip, or let's go ahead and just do python 3-m pip install and it's requests-html. This is a package that is used in conjunction with Python requests, or you could just use request.html. And the reason that, that request-html is because it's much better than beautiful soup, <laughs> uh, beautiful soup four. If you've ever watched any of my other web scraping stuff, this right here is something I've used in the past. H, uh, request-html is definitely the preferred method now. So make sure you install that one. Okay, so with this in mind, what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna add one more aspect to this and change this to write to txt or URL to txt, as in the HTML text. And then I'll go ahead and say save equals to false. And then if save, then I'll actually go through here and save it. But as my default, I'll just say false. So I'm not gonna do that but it is nice to know that we can. Okay, so next thing is, now that we've got this URL text, I need to extract what's in that URL text. So URL to TXT, let's go ahead and exit out of this again. And this time um, I actually want that resulted file or the resulted HTML text in here, right? So I can say something like this. I've got my URL, I've got a function that will call it. So let's go ahead and do the interactive shell again. This is obviously gonna run that URL for me, so I can go ahead and copy the HTML text here, and I should actually see that HTML text. So what Python requests allow me to do is we can say from requests underscore HTML, import the class of HTML, and then we just need to pass this HTML text or that string of text into this HTML text. Now that means that what it's gonna allow me to do is actually use requests HTML built-in built features to start parsing out the sort of standard HTML features that are coming in here. Now do keep in mind, if you want to get really nuts, you could learn how to parse each and individual item yourself and not rely on something like Python requests, which I think would be a really interesting exercise for those of you who want to get even, even deeper into this. So what I'm gonna go ahead and say then is the r underscore HTML equals to the HTML class. And this is gonna be, we wanna pass in the HTML string, which is a lot of HTML, saying a lot. Um, we're gonna go ahead and pass that in here with that actual variable. And then now if we look at our HTML, we get an object from that example here. I notice it's not showing the URL, that's because I'm not actually passing the URL to this. There is a way to use the URLs themselves, but I'm not gonna do that in this case because it's taking something we know and just adding a little extra feature that we don't necessarily know. Okay, so what we can do in here is do something like r underscore HTML dot find, and we can say like table, okay? I hit enter, it gives me a list of things that match the element table. Now, if you're familiar with HTML, you can type all of the different HTML elements, like H1, A, all of that. You can definitely do those things and start to go even deeper and find under there, which we'll talk about in a second. But how do you actually know what to look for? So inside of this box office here, I'm gonna go ahead and control click or right click and into inspect. This is called inspecting the element and you'll see something like this. Let's see if I can zoom in there. Um, so now I can actually bring my mouse over any given element and it's gonna zoom into what that element is, right? So in this case, I've got this div ID here. This appears to be the, the actual table that we need, which I could try this out by coming in here and hitting delete element. And what do you know, that, that table goes away completely. So let's go ahead and refresh that page and inspect the element again, and just, just kind of navigate up. I have this other one called table as well, but it doesn't seem like that's the whole table. As you see, the highlighted blue area isn't actually the entire table, it's just the really top part. So the only thing that's really the entire part is this right here. 
And again, we just deleted that same element. So it's, it's definitely clear that that's the one. Um, so I also noticed that how they named their classes, don't even worry if you don't know exactly what this means, but you do see that it says class equals and it's a string of stuff. Um, how they name their classes kind of give you an indication that, hey, this might be the entire table. It says IMDB dash scroll dash table. That's not, that's not that amazing. It's pretty simple. So let's go ahead and try that one out. So what we want to do then is with this HTML text, I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to print out HTML or, well, first of all, we have to redeclare the HTML text as R underscore HTML equals to HTML and HTML equals to HTML text. Let's make sure we import that. So from requests underscore HTML, we're going to go ahead and import the HTML class. And there we go. So this is how we declare it. This turns any HTML string into something that's managed by requests HTML. Pretty cool. So now that we've got that, what I can do is come in here and say the table underscore class, and we're gonna set that equal to something. So I'm gonna go ahead and just grab this entire thing here. I'm not gonna make any assumptions just yet. I'll just go ahead and grab this entire thing. Okay, so this is the table class that I'm gonna attempt to find. So I'll go ahead and do r underscore HTML dot find and we'll pass in table class, that's string itself. And I'll just go ahead and print out what that result is. And I'll just go ahead and say my table or rather r table as in requests table, request HTML table. I'll go ahead and print that out and let's take a look. I'll exit out of my old interactive shell press up, run into the new one, and I get this empty list here, right? So it's looking for this string here, but it's not finding anything. Now remember, if, if I just changed it to A, it will find something. So let's go ahead and exit out of this, run it again. This time it actually shows me all of the links that are in there. So of course the A element is for all links. It's an A tag, it's called an anchor tag. So what we wanna do, is we wanna find one of these elements. Now with HTML classes and how you actually find them is you use something called a selector, which we're just gonna use one of these classes. And like I said, my intuition is gonna be that it's this right here. And I'm just gonna find the number of instances that are there. Maybe there's more than just this one. And if there's more than just one, I might have to go back to the drawing table or the drawing board. <laughs> um, so when it comes to classes, the selector for class, this is the technical term for it, is you put a period in front of any given item that's in there, right? So period.mojo-gutter, period.imd-scroll-table-styles. If you're looking for a specific ID, you use a hash. So another potential option I'll put in here is table class equals to hashtag table because it's that ID, okay? So if you're familiar with CSS, this is very clear to you. If you're familiar with jQuery, this is very clear to you. Even JavaScript users, just pure JavaScript, you might be familiar with this as well. Uh, probably are, because it's uh, pretty basic HTML stuff here. Okay, so now that we've got this, let's go ahead and run that interactive shell again and run scrape. And what do you know? I have only one element in this list, right? as you can see by this enclosing thing. So, so this element is another HTML type class. It's just called an element. So what that means is I can actually search inside of that class as well. Um, another thing that I can do is I should be able to actually grab the value that's inside of any given HTML element. So let's go ahead and say, if the length of R underscore table equals to one, then we're gonna go ahead and print our table, our table, let's make sure we're using table, not HTML, our table dot text. Much like requests, just pure old Python requests does r dot text. We should be able to do the exact same thing with requests HTML. So we are gonna get rid of this r table here. Instead, I'm just gonna print out the text that comes from it. So let's go into our interactive shell again. I'm gonna exit out of the original one and run it again. 
and I'm getting list item has no attribute text. Um, that's just a little mistake because our table is a list as we were verifying here. So we wanna make sure that that length is one. So we're just gonna go ahead and grit, get the very first position, which is the zeroth index or zero index. So let's go ahead and leave it in like this now. So back into the terminal, exit and out, run that Python interactive shell again. And what do you know? It's actually giving me all of that data. Uh, this is gonna be a lot more clear if I, if I do something like this, or even on your own machine, you'll see all of that same data. Um, so that's pretty cool. So that's nice, but it's not as structured as I'd hope. Now what I wanna do is actually turn this table into a list of lists. In other words, the very first item in my list of lists will be the header. The second one will be the actual first row of that table. This is gonna turn it into a CSV at some point or comma separated values item at some point. So to do this, I can do something really cool. And that is, I'll go ahead and say parsed table equals to our table and the zeroth element. And inside of here, I'll just go ahead and say rows equals to parsed table dot find TR. TR typically stands for table row inside of HTML. So if I tab down on the table rows themselves, I see that I've got my table rows just like that. And it is showing me all of these table rows. Okay, so one of the challenges of this though is I don't know where JavaScript is potentially causing an issue with my glancing at these things. So before I actually look for those table rows, let's go ahead and see what JavaScript is doing. So notice that inside of my scroll table, I have two actual table elements here, or actually three table elements in here uh, that are causing potential issues for me when it comes to doing this web scraping. So inside of having this console open, remember if you go to view developer, you can view source and this will actually uh, bring up that page. So you don't wanna do that. You wanna do view developer tools. I just toggled it, I closed it. So let's make it open. And inside of here we'll do command shift P or control shift P if you're on Windows. And then we'll go ahead and disable JavaScript. After we disable JavaScript, I'm gonna go to refresh this Remember, we had three tables in here, maybe even more than that. Uh, now, if I break everything down inside of that scroll table, I only have one table now, or at least one that I can tell just by a quick glance. That is the difference between having JavaScript enabled and not. It just sort of parses things and makes things a lot different. Although my web browser looks pretty much the same. I'm gonna go ahead and re-enable JavaScript, but just understand that that's the reason I'm doing what I'm about to do. So command shift P and type enable JavaScript. You no longer need that on. And I'll just refresh that page. Okay, so again, I can now find all the rows with TR, or at least I hope I can. So I'll go ahead and print out rows. Let's go ahead and exit out of that interactive shell and run it again. And there are a bunch of table element rows here. So right now I have a list of elements. What I wanna turn it into is a list of lists. So let's go ahead and print out, I'll go for row in rows. I'm gonna go ahead and print out what each individual row is. And of course it's actually the element. So I'll go ahead and print out the text, much like I did up here, which I'll get rid of that actually. We don't need that any longer. And let's exit out and run that scraping again. And notice it's back to what we saw before when it was just the entire table. Uh, which is which is nice. It's actually getting a lot closer to what we need. But if I scroll to the very top, let's go ahead and expand this a little bit. Scroll to the very top. Uh, what I see is the very first row appears to be my header. Okay. So let's scroll this or break this down. So what I'll say is, and I'm just I'm just making educated guesses here. Rows zero. That's going to be my header. And then I wanna iterate through all of the other ones after zero, so one and beyond. This is a way to do that. So now if I run this, this should give me my header row and then only print out the actual row text that I need. So to make this nice and clear, I'll go ahead and close out that Python and open up a new terminal. 
and make sure that I'm in the correct day, of course. So back into day 12. And we'll do Python 3-i scrape.py. So this time I should not see that header if I did everything correctly. So I scroll up and I don't. I just see the very first row, which coincidentally has a number of one because it's based off of rank, right? Which is based off of all this other data. Cool. So I now have my rows of rows, but I just need to turn them into something. So that means I need to just take a look at the data a little bit closer yet again. So the first one I want to parse is the header. So I'll inspect this header here. And in this header or this TR, and of course I potentially could use the JavaScript being off, but I don't think I'll need that right now um, because of how HTML is structured in general. So I've got T TR and TH. So TH is each header column. And then if we scroll down a little bit inside of the elements, we've got the TRs here as well. And I've got also TH, but notice that this one says display none. So if I get rid of that element, hey, what do you know? The columns are back there. So that's the actual one that we're working off of, even though it, if it doesn't seem like it, or even if that's confusing, no worries. So this TR has TD. So typically on HTML elements, you'll have the header row will have TH as in table column, and then TD as in like a table cell, each cell for any given row. Okay, so that means is, long-winded way is saying columns equals to row dot find TD. And now I can go ahead and print out, let's just go ahead and say um, the four X in calls, I'll go ahead and print out X. Uh, let's go ahead and print out X and then a new line and a new line. Okay, I actually wanna get the iteration or the number that it's at. So like where, what position is it in, um, in this column? So I can do something called enumerate and enumerate will turn it into It'll give me the actual iteration it is, as well as X. So I can say I, or whatever the actual iteration is. So another, this is, a, this is kind of a cool thing to know, but for row and, or for X and row, you could do that same print statement. And then you could say something like I equals to zero, and then I plus equals to one, and then printing out I, and then X, Right, so this this right here does the same thing as this. It just uses a, another built-in function called enumerate. Okay, so now that I've got that, let's go ahead and exit this out. So this should give me each row, which maybe we wanna enumerate the rows as well, but it should give me each row, and then it's gonna give me the columns in that row with their iterations as well. Um, okay, so there we go. So I open this up. Notice that it's elements now. It's not actually the text, which is nice because it does differentiate things a little bit here. But it's giving me 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Pretty cool. So the next thing, of course, is just to turn those columns into text. So x.txt. And maybe we should make this a little bit more explicit by just saying call, as in column. And exit out of this again. Oops, run it again. And now we see those actual values. Okay, so a quiet place part two, looks like I made $163. So let's go into Chrome and scroll to the very bottom, a quiet place part two, $163 and it was four, okay? And what row number was it? Well, it has a rank of 32, which we can tell by this right here. So that was that final one. All right, cool. So with this new knowledge, we can now get the header names themselves. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do this and say header names equals to x.text for x in header. And this is really header row. So let's just call it header row. Okay, so that's the header row. Now we iterate through all of the columns. 
Let's go ahead and do that. So I've got all of my rows, all of the columns is really what's interesting here. So I'll go ahead and say row data is equal to an empty list. And now what I'll do is just do row data dot append call dot text. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of these print statements here for a moment. And with this row data, I'll go ahead and make another list here called table data and set that equal to an empty list. So each, remember I'm making a list of lists. So table data dot append row data, okay? And then finally, I'm gonna go ahead and print out what that table data is. I'm actually gonna declare this table data up here. And I'll also declare an empty list for header names. So let's go ahead and print out both of those. I'll print out the header names and then I'll print out the table data. Okay, so it's gonna parse the table. It's gonna look for all of our rows. It's gonna assume the very first row is the header row because of what we did with the investigation. Obviously, that's not gonna work with everyone. Uh, then it's gonna loop through all those row, rows and then it's gonna loop through all those columns and each one of those columns is gonna be put into its own list at a specific point, right? It's gonna be in there at a specific iteration which will correspond to its position inside of this row data. Okay, and then all of those things should match. Let's go ahead and exit out of here, run that again. Okay, so I get element object is not iterable. Uh, of course, okay, so header row, it's giving me that. That's because I didn't do the thing that I should have done, which was header row columns or header row, missed one piece there. We did talk about it and it was TH. Okay, so that's roughly the same thing that we did down here, but it's just in one line. Okay, so we go ahead and exit this out. And if you're more comfortable writing a for loop in multiple lines, by all means, go ahead and do it. I realize this is maybe a little bit advanced of a syntax, but you gotta start seeing the real things as they happen. Okay, so now if I open this up, here we go, I've got a row of rows. Here is the columns, right? So I've got rank, release group, and so on. And then if I look at the very first item in here, I've got rank, the name of the item here, the element, and so on. So it's actually giving me all of the things that I want. So I can actually test this, this out, right? So I have, uh, let's go ahead and close this down a little bit. I have, I've got table data. So let's go the first element in the table data. So table data is zero, and I've got bad boys for life, okay? So header names, header names, there we go. So what's the release group name of table data at, z at position, let's say position, I don't know, five. Okay, so this should give me a rank of five, potentially six, if we do our positions right, and then it'll give me the name of that movie based off of these things, okay? So we hit enter. The gentleman, so it's actually rank of six. Remember those indexes, they start with zero. And the worldwide gross is 117 million and some, some change there. So going into rank six, we've got the gentleman, 117 million and some change. Cool. So I now have scraped this data successfully, okay. Um, even though it might have felt like a little bit of a stretch, but the data has been scraped. Um, I certainly want to improve this over time, but before I improve it, I'm just gonna go ahead and save it to a CSV file. I'm gonna exit out of here. Let's go into the terminal, and I wanna, I wanna actually clear this out. And I'm gonna install one more thing, and that's Python 3-m pip install pandas. Now Python Pandas makes it really easy to work with CSV files. There's a lot of things that go into making Pandas work really well that I'm not gonna cover right now.
But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the data that we have into pandas just so we can save a file. It's it's really just that's all we're doing. We're not manipulating things. We're just saving the file itself. OK, so let's go into VS Code here. And I'm going to do the default for pandas, which is import pandas as PD. Before I actually finish this off, I do want to mention that there is other ways to write CSV files inside of Python. There's convenient ways to do it. There's inconvenient ways to do it. Pandas is by far the most convenient, but also is going to set you up for doing a lot more things related to data and CSV files and other data science related things inside of Pandas or inside of Python, even if you don't intend to do that ever. Uh, but I do think it's a really good thing to learn eventually once you have a better grasp of Python itself. Now we're going to declare what's called a data frame, which is typically denoted as DF. And then we'll do PD as in pandas dot data frame or the data frame class. This is how it's written all the time. They don't actually import the class very often. And then we're going to pass in our actual data. So in my case, it was table data. And then we're going to also pass in the argument columns equals to header names. And then we're going to go ahead and do DF dot two underscore CSV. And then the name of it, I'm going to call it movies.csv. And then we'll just pass in index being false. By all means, try index being true and see what that result is. Uh, but in my case, I'm going to do index being false. OK, so pandas makes it really easy to write all of this stuff. And we'll see that now. So let's go ahead and try out the scraping program again. Uh, I don't have any errors in this case. So make sure you, you actually copy it exactly like this. And let's go ahead and look at my project. I'm going to open up the Explorer a little bit. So let's go ahead and actually just see this in a program that you might be familiar with, like Numbers or Excel. So I'll Reveal and Finder. And I'll just double click that CSV file. Typically, CSV files will open up in Numbers or Excel. And what do you know? I've got a header and I've got all of that data. Now, if you left the index in there, you would see a whole nother row or rather a whole nother column with starting from zero and going to 31 most likely. OK, so now I have the actual way to take that data and put it somewhere that I want to. But I'm not quite done. I actually want to make this a little bit better in the sense that if we look at our data. So going back into the 2020 Worldwide Box Office, I want to go to 2019. And this is where URLs are often very, very logical. If we look at the URL, it says 2019. So let's go ahead and jump into guessing, I don't know, 2015. And what do you know? 2015 Worldwide Box Office. So this is where web scraping becomes very, very valuable. Because you might have been like, oh, well, hey, I can just copy and paste that whole thing into a CSV file. Probably would work. No big deal. But... We don't want to have to do that. We don't want to, have to repeat ourselves over and over again. OK, so let's go ahead and turn these things into functions a little bit better. Right. So I have the first function, which is, you know, URL to TXT. The next function would be to say define parse and extract. Let's call it that. And again, I'm going to go ahead and pass in that URL. I'm going to leave the only thing I'll leave out is the URL. Everything else I'll just go ahead and tab in. OK. And in this case, I'll go ahead and say file name base or just like name it. In my case, I'll call it 2020. Right. So this name itself will be what's going to be for my CSV file which I want to put in here correctly. Not to worry, I will go back up and make sure I did do that. OK, so um, let's go ahead and first of all, make sure that there is a table with the class that we have. And now once we have the table, let's we've got the parsed here and then we've got this for loop. And then finally, we can go ahead and come in here. In this case, I'll just give this that name that I'm passing. So name. Now, naturally, I'll probably want to have a location for this. Like typically, you'd want to store it not in the root of your project. So let's go ahead and just call this data slash. And in this case, 
I'm going to be a little lazy and just type out data for that directory. Now going back, we would want to, you know, OS path dot, uh, join and then, you know, get the actual path to it and actually create that path so it's completely reusable. And let's be honest, we should probably do that. So I'll just go ahead and say path equals to OS path dot join and base dir and data OS dot make durs and it's path. And then we'll just go ahead and say exist okay equals to true. Okay, so that means of course we need to import OS. Whenever you feel like being lazy, don't be lazy. That's my rule. So base dir equals to OS path dot dir name of this file. And there we go. So now that we've got that, of course that, that actual final path will be file path equals to OS path dot join. And it's gonna be data. You know, a big part of the reason I'm doing this too is for you Windows users that are like, hey, that's not how my paths are set up. And what the heck, man? Okay, cool. There, now it's a much fun much more functional function. Okay, so it's got parse and extract. It calls that other function that we already set up. And let's go ahead and just call that now. And I'll do to uh, parse and extract of that URL. Okay, so the first one, I'll go ahead and just grab world and do 2020. So at the very end of this, I'll go ahead and say 2020. So let's bring this down and put it right above where we actually call it. Okay, so there we go. Let's exit out of here. And I apologize if that was really fast for you. Um, I just sort of assumed that you've already done all of this stuff in the other parts, but if you haven't, um, just, just keep in mind that we do cover it in the other parts if that was really fast for some of you. So let's go ahead and run that. And now I've got Python 3 scrape. I got path is not defined. Yes, of course it's not because that should be a lowercase path. Let's try that again. Exit out and run it. And now if I go into my Explorer, into data, I've got 2020 here. Now, of course, what I want to do is I want to actually test that the URL and the naming stuff is actually working. In other words, I want to go ahead and try 2019 and then just pass, you know, name equals to 2019. Save that and let's go ahead and run it again. So hopefully what this will do is actually give me a value right next to this. And sure enough, it does. And I can open that up right here inside of VS Code. I see the header and then Avengers Endgame is number one for 2019. No surprises there. Okay, so now what I wanna do is actually run through and scrape any given year and maybe go back several years from that. So I did import the date time module for year of now. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this out and paste all of this down here. So I'm gonna call this run. So in here, I'll go ahead and say start year. And then I'll also go ahead and say years ago. And I wanna set some default values here. So for years ago, I'm gonna go ahead and just say 10. So it's gonna start 10 years ago. And then I'm gonna go ahead and use the start year being none. And I want to go ahead and assert that the start year is an instance of an integer. So start year is an integer. So is instance of int. Now, of course, the reason for that is we want to make sure that whatever we're passing through here is an actual integer. Otherwise, it will raise an error for me. But before I even do that, what I can also do is just say if start year equals to none, then I can just set that year as to now or this year whatever this year is cool okay so with that i can now replace our url here and say f and change this to being whatever that year is and naturally i could also make sure that it has of a certain length so the length of start year is equal to uh, four so we want it to be four digits long right 
And I could do additional things like making sure that it is a valid year because like year 3000 is not a valid year, but that's okay. It's even more okay because up here, we have this URL to text. And basically if the status code is 200, it's gonna return, well, an empty string. So maybe we should actually leave it as an empty string because what's gonna happen is it's gonna look for you know that HTML inside of an empty string and then it's gonna try and find that table and only look if that table has a value of one. So we're pretty safe even if we have the wrong start year in here or whatever this year ends up being. Okay, um, oops, I should probably place that as start year and then year and then year. Okay, so notice I did not actually do anything with time ago yet, but that's okay. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run Python 3 scrape.py and it shouldn't actually do anything, right? So it's taking um, no run statement. So let's go ahead and make sure I actually call this and I'm gonna call that in the main statement. So again, if name equals to main, then we'll go ahead and run it. And I'm just not gonna take any arguments yet. So I'll save that. And I'm gonna go ahead and delete this directory of data. And let's go ahead and run that. And I get object of type int has no length. Um, of course it doesn't. So we wanna turn it into a string here. So the string, you can only count, you can't count the length of a, <laughs> of a, um, of a number the only way you can count the length of a number is by turning it into a string and therefore you now have that. That's a good error to talk about. Now I run this again. And as we see here, it actually created the year and started with all that. Um, but what I actually wanna do is be able to iterate through all this stuff. So I wanna have a start year, but then I wanna do years ago and subtract from that start year. Cause I made sure that the instance was an integer and I made sure that it, you know, it had four digits in it basically. So what I'm gonna do is say four I in range, and this is gonna be zero, and it's gonna be, it's gonna take zero and then years ago plus one. Okay, so I also might wanna assert that the years ago is an integer as well, just in case you didn't actually do that correctly. So with this loop then, I'm just gonna go ahead and tab this in. And now I'm gonna go ahead and say that I is gonna be the start year still. So each iteration, I will use whatever that start year is. And then at the end of that iteration, I will subtract one from it. So it's gonna go through the entire years ago iterations and then I'll subtract one eventually. So let's go ahead and and obviously it starts off with that initial start year. So no matter what it is, it's starting off with that initial start year. And I'll go ahead and print out um, a string here saying finished and maybe the year. Okay, so let's go ahead and save it and I'll run the scrape again. And now what I should actually have, oops, that should be start year. My mistake, okay, let's try that again. And now what it should be doing is actually iterating through all of those years. It's actually scraping, you know, 2020 and then 2019, and then it'll be 2018 and so on. It will actually go through all 10 of those years. And if we did everything correctly, we look in here and, you know, what do you know? There it is right there, right? Um, so I could go one step further and actually pass in arguments that are coming from, you know, the 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 uh, command line itself if we are so inclined. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm just gonna still use sys. There is another way to parse arguments, the something that we haven't covered yet, so I'm not gonna talk about it just yet. So if you remember correctly, we use sys.argv. So the number of arguments that are on the command line. Uh, scrape.py is considered an argument, so it's the actual you know file that we're gonna be running is considered an argument. So we wanna get argument one, and I'm gonna go ahead and get argument two. And all I'm gonna do is say year and, or maybe start and uh, duration. That's probably a little bit closer. Or maybe count, as in the number of years here. And I wanna turn those both into integers. So this is a really simple way to set something like that. 
Um, but I want to go ahead and say try start equals to the int of start. Okay, uh, and make an accept block here and then just say start equals to none. And then we'll do try count equals to the int of count or again, whatever that system argument is. And then otherwise we'll just return a value and I'll just give a count of one. So run here, we'll take these two arguments and change them slightly. So we'll go ahead and do the count being years ago and the start being start year. And there we go. Um, and I've now finished all 10 of those years. So let's go ahead and try scrape and I'll do, let's say 2005 and I'll do five years. So there are my two arguments there. I hit enter and what I should see is hopefully 2005 showing up here as it shows finished 2005 and there is 2005. That's pretty cool. Okay, so that is now scraping all of that data. And realistically, the historical data, we're probably not gonna need to scrape on a regular basis. It's more of like this year's data that we need because 2019 is done none of that data is really going to be updated. And if 2019 or a year ago's data is still being updated as they calculate delayed reporting or whatever it is, or they fix reporting, um, cause that happens too. Like they might have to fix numbers for sales or whatever. Um, so every once in a while you might actually do periodically go back in time, but realistically what you'll probably want to do is change the default years ago to just, to just one. So up here, that argument of one. So if I come in and just say 2020, um, what we are getting is, oh, here's our first error list index out of range because this is saying, hey, you gotta make sure that you're passing in an argument of some kind. So instead of just doing it blanket like that, I'll just come in here and replace it into this try block. And I still wanna turn those into integers and this means that I don't have to pass in any arguments basically because it'll go with those defaults. So I'll run that again. And now it's just gonna be doing 2020, finishes off 2020, and that should be it, right? It shouldn't actually go into, up. Oh, in this case it did 2019. Now, why is that? Well, actually it hopefully makes sense because it does this year and a year ago. So if you change that count to being zero, it's only gonna go through one number. So again, years ago, no years ago, just 2020. And that will give me only 2020. And if I try a different year that doesn't actually exist, like 2021, um, I'm probably not gonna get any data here, right? So it says document is empty. Okay, so that gives me another thing that I can add here. And that's saying that the HTML document is empty. So instead of returning an empty string here, I'll just say none. And then this HTML text, if HTML text equals to none, return. So just end the function itself, right? It won't go through the rest of it. So we save that and we run it again. And there you go. So finish 2021 and so on, right? And so finished should probably actually be more accurate to what happened here. So at the end of this, I'll go ahead and say return true as in it did finish. So it went through that loop here. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is just change that length a little bit. So I'm gonna tab this back and say if the length is not equal, or rather if the length of the table is equal to zero, then we'll just go ahead and return false. And yet again, I'll return false up here. Okay, or something along those lines. So if it's equal to zero or if it's not greater than zero, um, then we wanna return that false. So then this means that down here, I can say finished equals to that. And we'll do if finished else print something like start year not found or not done, not finished. Okay, so we save that, run it again. And there we go, that's that's probably a little bit better. So we can say, you know, 2018 again, and this time it should actually go through, find 2018 and do all of the things it needs to for actually scraping that web page. Okay, um, so 
as far as the code is concerned, there are a number of things that we can consider here uh, to improve it. Number one is we perhaps we want to extract the table as its own function, like looking for the actual table, um, whatever that might be, or even passing and extracting just all of the table data with the header and then doing something with that data, right? So like actually saving that data, storing it, doing something like that, or um, instead of adding it in as a CSV file, we, we actually add it into a database of some kind, like a Django database or a Django model. Um, that's something else that we could do. Another thing we could do is consider how to actually update how this data is actually handled, right? So if you remember back to when we were doing all this, the header names, those have iterations. So each index item for any given header corresponds to the row below it. So you could actually use key value pairs instead of just appending data here. Um, so what I mean by that is in this row here, let's go ahead and just say row data. I'll actually even get you started here. So we'd say row data and we have an index item here. So I could say header name equals to header names of whatever that index value is. And then we would say row data header name equals to the column text. Okay. Now the reason I actually didn't fully do this is because if we look at that header, the very top has a parentheses sign on both of these, right? So that actually means domestic percent and foreign percent, right? Um, so what you're gonna find is your row data is not gonna match or rather the row Let's change this from row data to row dict data. What you're gonna find is the row dict data is not gonna match the row data. And that's actually a pretty good challenge for you on how you could go about solving that, of actually changing this header, these two headers into their corresponding domestic and foreign percent sign. Because if you know, as you probably already know, uh, this is a little redundant, but if I did something like this twice, it's just overriding the other value. So it's not gonna be accurate as to what that is, or you could even consider deleting it altogether. Now, if you end up using a dictionary or a row of dictionaries, which you absolutely can, you'd still wanna append this to a row, your data frame here, so I'm gonna go ahead and say up here, and let's call this table data dix, as in dictionaries, then I would actually just append what that data is down here. Append, and that's gonna be row data dict, just like that. And this data frame here, instead of using this one, we could then just use just that dictionary itself. Because of how cool pandas is, it actually can convert dictionaries really easy into data frames. Dictionaries, of course, can also be used to create Django models or the SQL alchemy. You can use a dictionary and unpack a dictionary to match the table values with the key value pairs that dictionaries have, which is also really cool. Um, I'm gonna actually leave these things commented out, so if you ever come back to this, you'll see the actual comments, but um, I'm not actually gonna show you exactly how to do all of that uh, in solving that problem. I think that's a really good challenge, and I'm hoping that you're at a point now that you could actually go ahead and address it. If you do find that challenge, feel free to submit it on GitHub as a pull request and we'll take a look, or you can submit it as an issue. Just submit it on GitHub and we'll take a look. Okay, so that's it for day 12. I realized we did a ton here and hopefully you got a lot out of it. The keys I would take away from this is number one, you can always just start out by saving the data and parse it later. That is actually a really good method of doing things because it's a lot easier to make sense of the data once you have it versus trying to make sense of the data after you don't have it, right? Of course that makes sense. So the more delayed data you're gonna collect, the easier it's gonna be to make sense of it later. So honestly, even if you just stopped at this and you're like, okay, I don't know parsing yet, I don't know how to do that, I wanna do some more web scraping, that's completely okay. The next thing is this is where some understanding of HTML and CSS comes in, being able to actually parse out the correct data in there. But as you see, the tools for parsing are very simple, or at least they're simple now. They have been a little bit more complex, and certainly 
even requests HTML can get more request, uh, more advanced than this. This is just sort of simple usage, but you know, sometimes doing things simply is better or easier than doing it more on the more complex level. And that's, that was my hope here. And that's also true with how I looped through all these rows. Uh, you know, I, I made these lists specifically to make it as simple as possible. And that's why I talked about the data dictionaries later for that exact reason. And then of course this run part, um, this doesn't have to be done. You could just do it where the arguments are going directly into this extraction. I just did it this way because I know that in general, I'm gonna wanna scrape multiple things, not just one. And so this is a way to think, start thinking about how to scrape multiple things, not just one, and by having a single function that can actually scrape and save everything, that part is really cool as well. All right, well, thanks for watching day 12. Of course, we went through web scraping because the website we looked at didn't actually have what's called an API. Now, APIs make it super easy to grab the data that that website or service might be using. And that's actually how so many of the applications that you know and love today are so powerful. It's like, why do they have so much data? In some cases, yeah, they do use web scraping. In other cases, they use these third-party APIs or other people's data. Think about it this way. If Box Office Mojo, the website we used, if that one had an API to just give us this data, would we have much to talk about? Well, probably not. Not that much because APIs make it unbelievably easy and that's actually what we wanna do very soon. So make sure you stay with us.